their children's church. There is children's church, okay? So those that will be going to children's church can be dismissed at this time. The rest of us, I'm going to ask you to stand with me and turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22. As you find Matthew chapter 14, beginning in verse 22, I just want us to think about a thought when it feels as if we are sinking in life. When it feels as if we are sinking in life. In life. Matthew chapter 14 and verse 22, the scripture reads, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him and to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come unto the ship, the wind ceased. And then they which were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Fathers, we bow before you this morning. We thank you so much for your presence here today. I thank you, Lord, for just the sweet, sweet spirit that's been moving in our midst already. And I pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would continue to work through the preaching of your word. I pray for your anointing and the unction from on high. I ask that you would hide me behind the cross. I pray that you would be seen and that you would be lifted up, that you would draw men unto yourself, that you would save the lost, that you would revive the saved, that you would strengthen the weak and the weary, that you give clarity to those seeking direction and guidance that you'd give whatever need we have, you'd provide that according to your riches and glory, according to your perfect will and way. And may we be a people that are willing to receive your word and respond to your word today as you move in our midst. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If there was anything that I've learned in the 44 years that I've been alive in this world and I didn't learn very much very quick. But I've learned that this life has ups and downs, ins and outs, comings and goings, uh, without very little warning a lot of times. That this life is full of troubles, full of struggles. I've quote Job all the time, with this in mind when he says, a man that's born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And he was right. And he understood that. And the interesting thing about Job is that when Job faced his troubles, God described him as a righteous man. In fact, there was nobody on the face of the earth that was righteous like Job. And I personally believe that Job was probably a contemporary or lived during about the same time as Abraham did. So when God makes a statement like there was nobody like Job on the face of the earth, I think that's some pretty high praise, especially when it comes from God himself. 
Job was a man that hated evil and strived to live for good. And he had all kinds of blessings from God, from a big family to much wealth, to much influence in his community, with a healthy body. He had much going on in his life as he served the Lord, served as a priest unto his own family, offered sacrifices for his children. You go back and read the beginning of the book of Job and you can find these things. But what we also find is that as much as God is real and as much as God blesses and as God as much moves, we also know there's a reality of an enemy. We understand that Satan is real and we understand that troubles arise. We understand we live in a fallen world. We understand that things can change on a dime. Uh, Priscilla's sister used to get on a church bus and I'd help drive the bus every once in a while when I was pastoring in Clay County and Miss Marie would climb up in the bus and she would get there in the front seat and we would turn and she said, now, Brother Anthony, you can turn this thing on a dime and have eight cents left over. Uh, we know that's how life changes sometimes. Things happen just like that. I want to talk to you about that this morning. I want us to think about that. Uh, in our own world, we know that's the facts. If you want to step back for a minute from your own little world, and I say that because many times that's where we stay in our own little world. But if you step back for a second, you'll see that this world as a whole is a mess. You see that things are just overwhelming. And sometimes you see that things are beyond control. If you look out here and just watch with simple observation, that'll mess you up enough if that's all you look at. If you start asking questions and inquiring things amongst folks that you live with in this world, that's going to scare you all the more. You say, what do you mean by that? Let me tell you something, folks. There's a lot of folks out here, and the majority of them don't believe the Bible is the inspired and errant and foul board of God. It's sure not a standard for them. It's also interesting to think, just as we look in the scripture before and we've seen the book of Ephesians, that we were once people who walked after the course of this world. When you start asking questions, are you not just realizing that folks don't believe in the one true and living God, the scriptures and the principles thereof, but they are deceived and entrenched in the ways or the course of this old world that's under the influence of the prince of the power of the air. And so when you see all these things going on out there in the world around us, and then you start narrowing things down. You see what's going on out there far away from here in this old world. You say, that's bad, but it's not here. And then you start to realize the world's not as big as you thought it was. And you start having issues right here in our own community. Whether you want to talk about the, the shooter that I guess is still on the loose, if he's still alive, if he's out there running around, I don't know. But uh, he may not have... Uh, successfully taken any lives of the right now, but I'll tell you what he has done as he has brought about fear in the life of a lot of people. And we allowed that fear to be easily generated. And I'm not saying it's not a scary thing, but just a few years ago, we allowed um, that of a, of, of a pandemic, if you would, I don't even like to use the term, but pandemic, if you would, to, for, for folks to have been also fear. Driven, So we have over the last three or four or five years, whatever now, that it has allowed us to be conditioned to be a fearful people and to shut down very easily. And I'm not saying we shouldn't protect. I'm not saying that. I'm not getting on here to tell you if I want to get on a, on a big topic on what we should be doing exactly. I serve on a school board in Clay County and I was uh, talked with the superintendent, a part of some of our closing down of our schools for a little bit. So we talked a little bit about that, um, you know, over there. I know there's all kinds of ideas. There's all kinds of folks that are masters and, and, and brains about everything, especially those that can hide behind computer screens and keyboards. They do a good job. They can run the show, but they ain't really doing anything. I understand that's what we live in. But what I do understand is this too. We've allowed conditions and circumstances around us to become a fearful people. And I'm going to talk to you about when life seems like it's just sinking in all around us. I want to see a few things in this passage of scripture because that's where we need to go, folks. 
When we live in a time and a day and a culture that's been difficult, and it's not just 2024. It's from the time of the fall of humanity has sin and Satan been present, uh, the reality of death and all of those things. I mean, it got so bad so quick that God destroyed everything off the face of the earth by means of a worldwide flood. So it didn't take very long from the time of the fall of Adam and Eve and all of humanity for God to step in and bring about a massive judgment. And as just as that happened, judgment's right around the corner in our day too. And I want us to understand that, that man has dealt with evil. He has dealt with uncertainty. He has dealt with all the things that we deal with today. And, and we live in this time as we are. And, and just as, as um, I think Julie seen it and she posted something in response. So many times we, we're afraid of the day in which we live in, but we forget, as the book of Acts says, that God has before ordained the bounds of your habitation. He did not just predetermine where you're going to live. Guess what else he predetermined? When you're going to live. Just like Esther was where she was at for such a time as this. Just like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and the rest of the Hebrew boys that were taken away by Nebuchadnezzar were born for such a time as that. Just like Daniel, or David was a young man who was born just for a time as that to be there in the valley of the shadow of death facing Goliath. He was there because God had a purpose and a plan for him. Just like the disciples when they were there, just like for us today, folks, we have to realize that God has a purpose and a plan for you and for me and for the world as a whole. And we can't ever forget that. In fact, that's what has to drive us. That's what has to motivate us. That's what has to give us a peace that passes all understanding in the midst of fear. But look what kind of day we're in. We have a, a shooter over here and then, and then everybody's on high alert. I don't know if you have been paying attention a whole lot around here, but I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there, there's, I've seen more presence of law um, than I've had in a long time in Laurel County. I don't live here, but I work here, so I'm here 90% of the time over here. I see that every time you're around. I'm telling you what, I'm telling you, you better be careful. You better not look funny. You better not drive erratic because they're coming after you. Everywhere, telling you, there's a lot going on right now. Everybody's on edge, shooting up there in Hazard, all this stuff going on. I never drove down the interstate like I've drove down the interstate here lately. You say, what do you mean? Oh, not afraid, but I'm telling you, I look around everywhere when I'm driving right now. I look over in the woods. I look over in the cliff. I look up that way. I look over this way. You don't know what's going to do. You don't know what a person over here, Julie said, uh, yesterday we, we come back from Tennessee. We just went down there for the day. And, and we was coming back. She said, I was driving by this person and they were driving slow. And as soon as I started to go around them, then all of a sudden they want to speed up. She said, I didn't know what to think about these folks. I didn't ever know what somebody's going to do next. And you don't. Everybody's on edge. Everybody's, you know, all shaking up. And I'll say everybody. I use that in a blanket sense. I don't know exactly how you're feeling, but I know that most folks experience some overwhelming sense when different things are going on. I want to see a few things in this passage to see how we address it. Understand a little bit of the context. Jesus just got done feeding 5,000 men and their families. And after he gets done feeding, the disciples were serving. They, they, they went about, had 12 basketfuls left over of the food and everything's finished up. They're wrapping up everything and and, and then all of a sudden, Jesus takes his disciples, gets them on a the ship, starts to send them across the sea as he's going to send the multitude on home. And so that's what he does. And then he goes by himself to commune with the Father, and he is there. But while he is there by himself, sent the, the multitude home, his disciples are on the boat, and they're out there in the sea. Now, we've looked at this passage before, and so it's not new to you. But I want to see a few things. The first thing I want us to see is just because God's doing a work doesn't mean you're not facing a trial around the corner. Now, think about this. The disciples just experienced a miracle. 
They, they were there. Jesus had been teaching. He had been sharing to this multitude and they were tired. It was getting late and they were hungry. And Jesus tells his disciples, go sit them down and feed them lunch. And his disciples said, hold on a second. How are we going to feed all these people? I mean, it'd take a whole year's worth of money to do that, right? Tell me that the church didn't start as the Baptist church. Hello. They had a business meeting before the church was even birthed in Acts chapter 2. And guess what they said? We ain't got enough money. They ain't got enough people neither. 12 people serving 5,000. Hello. That's, that's not enough people. That's not enough money. But you know what the difference is? When you got Jesus involved, 12's enough and, and no money's enough. Why? Because he's the one that owns the cattle on a thousand hill. So, so when you understand that he made everything out of nothing, you don't have to worry about that. But we have to get to the point that Jesus is there. But experience a miracle. So Jesus says, sit them down. The young lad says, here, I've got a sack lunch that my mama made for me. Got a few pieces of bread and fish. And Jesus blesses that bread and fish, breaks that bread and fish, gives it to the multitude, I mean, gives it to the disciples to feed the multitude. And they, everyone ate and they were full and they had 12 basketfuls left over. God wasn't even concerned about being wasteful. Hello? Huh? Jesus didn't say, go take them 12 baskets out there and make sure they cram that down their throat. We're not going to waste nothing today. Don't you understand what the economy's like? Don't you understand what money's like? You don't grow on trees these days. Jesus didn't do all that. He said, I'm here to tell you, no matter what the circumstance is, no matter what's going on, I'm able to overcome it and we can have 12 basket full left over just so you know there's always plenty when I'm doing the work. And so they experience this miracle, right? You're walking on cloud nine. They're probably talking to each other like, man, this is amazing on what he is doing. And so as they're thinking about it, they're not thinking about right, what's right around the corner. And you know what? Shouldn't. You can't live by wondering what's going on tomorrow or in the next five minutes. You got you to gotta live in the moment. I'm not saying that we're not, not having somewhat of a plan. I'm planning on going to work in the morning. But at the same time, you know, I might not make it to tomorrow. Tomorrow may not show up. I don't know what's going to happen. I could die. Rapture could happen. You know, who knows what could take place. I have somewhat of a tentative plan, but I don't know how it's going to happen and how it's going to completely unfold. But I have to live in the right now. And so understand we can't live just like, but they didn't see what was going around the corner. They get done talking with Jesus there and Jesus puts them in the ship and sends them into the sea. Jesus sends his multitude away and goes and communes with the Father. It says he sent the multitude away. He went up into the mountain apart from them to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. So as he stayed by himself for some time, he gets into the middle of the night and the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves for the wind was contrary. I, I want us to understand that when we think about life and the things that we go through and, we, and the uncertainties in which we face, and the things that we did not plan for, understand that God knows all things and God has a purpose in things. This specific situation, God led his disciples, put them in the ship and put them in the sea, knowing the storm was coming. Hello? That may not be all that comforting to you right now, thinking about that, but let me tell you something. That is comforting to me. You know why? Because God does nothing wrong. He is all good. He is perfect in all his ways. And he has ways that are way above our ways. You know, when we think about this situation right here, not many of us are going to put our kids in a situation where we're worried about the storm coming. And, and we probably should because me and, me and Paul Bragg has talked about this before. Sometimes I wonder if we're raising up a whole soft generation. You know, but just like yesterday when, when we was down there in Tennessee, you know, we, we was over there by Dollywood and, and, and by Splash Country. And, and when we was there, 
um, we was all right there and we, we, we went for a walk. We went around a different part of the park. And, and while we was going down around the park, um, I can't even remember what we were doing. And I said, where's Annabelle at? Now, I mean, she's getting big. She's 12, you know. I said, where's Annabelle at? And Julie's like, well, I don't know. She may have went all the way back over to the wave pool because she said something about um, ice cream or something. I don't remember what she said. And, and I said something about, well, you got your pass over there. And, and I'm thinking, I didn't say nothing to her. Then Julie, I'm like, what are you talking about? Send her all the way over to the wave pool. Go get money over at the wave pool. Going all the way over. That's all the other side of the park. I never said a word. And I'm thinking, why, am, why are we sending the kid over there? And I, I, and I said, we need to walk over there. Well, AJ started walking over there. He walked. We weren't, we were, they weren't panicking. I never said a thing about it. That's when I know where she was at. Now, if she was going over there, I didn't know she went. He said, what are you worrying about? I know when I was a kid, my mom, I seen a little something on Facebook, little kids riding bicycles said, mom never knew how many miles we rode these things. <laughs> that is the fact. I live in Fairfield, Ohio. I've been on one side of Fairfield to the next, and I don't know how many miles wide it is. Walking and riding a bicycle from the time I left home in the morning, supposed to be home by dark. My mom didn't know everywhere I went. That's crazy when I think about it today. He said, we wouldn't do that. Well, look what God did. How many understand here today? I want you to understand that God has a purpose and a plan in your life specifically, that goes along with his plan as a whole, and sometimes he leads you right in the midst of harm's way. David said it like this, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil. Why? Because thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Yes, does God lead you by the still waters? Sure he does. He knows that the sheep were not going to drink from a rushing mighty river. They're afraid of that. So he brings you to the still waters to get you a drink. He knows that you need the green pastures to get something to eat and to lie down when you need to rest. Yes, he's a God that takes care of you every need with no questions or concerns. But folks, he also doesn't have a problem with leading you through the valley of the shadow of death for there's really no fear there. He's the one that conquered it anyway, did he not? I'm the resurrection and the life. Paul said, death, where's your sting? Grave, where's your victory? You got none. You got none no more. Why? Because Jesus bore it all for us. He took on the sting of death. He took on the, the grave and he defeated them. The only thing in this passage of scripture, I want us to understand that when you're dealing with things in life and you feel like things are sinking or you're sinking in the midst of your life, you say, how do I get in a situation Step back for a minute and say, did God lead me this direction? Could be that. Could be that. Think about Job. <laughs> I've said this before, so if you've used this before yourself, don't get insulted, just listen for a minute. Folks said, oh man, I'm like suffering like Job. I don't think anybody suffered like Job. Okay. I don't think anybody got in the same category as Job. I'd say there ain't many of us God saying, that's a righteous man right there. Ain't nobody like him on the face of the earth. I'd say very few of us get in that conversation. Ain't many of us suffering like Job neither. But God had a purpose. Did God cause his children to die? Not in that situation. You're going to read the Bible. We understand who did it. Satan did it. Satan killed his children. Satan stole all of his wealth. Satan, Satan afflicted him physically. But God allowed it. Because without God allowing it, Satan's limited. But God had a purpose, didn't he? Nobody righteous like Job on the face of the earth. But was Job where Job needed to be? No, he needed to grow. Guess where Job didn't grow? On top of the mountain with all the wealth you could ever want. With all of the prestige and integrity of his walk with Jesus that you could ever need or want. With having the greatest family around that you could ever want. That ain't where he was growing. Where do you have to grow? He had to grow down in the valley. 
Now, though God didn't kill his children, though God didn't take his money, though God didn't inflict him with the pain and, and the sickness, God allowed Satan to do his thing, and he led Job right through it's the most difficult times you could ever face as an individual. And you know what Job ended up learning? He learned his Redeemer lives. That's what he learned. He asked, he, he, he made some statements like one day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to ask him some questions. <laughs> now he never cursed God. Satan said he would and he never did it. God knew exactly that Job would not do that. But he said, I'm going to ask him some questions. I don't understand why I'm going through what I'm going through. His friends turned on him. His wife was nagging. I don't want to give her too hard a time. She lost her children too. She lost her wealth too. Her husband was suffering. She's going through a lot. I'm not going to give her a whole, uh, that big of a hard time. We do that sometimes, but now them two are one. That's, if you ever wonder why his wife never died, they're two or one. God told Satan, you can't kill him. Satan couldn't kill her either. Interesting thing. But anyway, Job was pretty much seemed like he's on an island by himself. And he said, I'm going to ask God this. I'm going to ask God that. When I get opportunity, when the time came, God asked him a question first. Were you here when I created everything? Give me a paraphrase. Eventually, guess what Job did? Said nothing. He learned to say nothing, but what he did do is he grew. And you know what happened at the end of the story? God blessed him twice with everything that he had. Gave him more kids. What about the other ones? The other ones was in heaven. Then bring them back. Gave my thing, give him more children. When he going back, when he go to heaven, I said I'm ten, he had twenty. But he blessed him twice with everything. But God led him through the difficulties. God allowed him to go through the circumstances. God had told his disciples to get in the ship. He said straightway in verse twenty two, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into the ship. He physically put them in the ship. He knew they were going in the ship that was going into the sea, that was going to have a storm, that they were going to be in a situation that was going to be deadly to them. Yet he constrained them and put them on the boat. Let me tell you something, folks. I don't always understand it, but I know God knows perfectly. And my job isn't to be able to understand every detail of it. That's a problem we have sometimes. What we are to do is to walk by faith, walk according to the principles of the word of God and understand that our circumstances aren't too big for God and yet God has a purpose and a plan in those circumstances. And so God, if you're going to allow me to get in a ship, if you're going to put me in the ship, if you're going to put me out there in the sea, if you know the storm's coming, I'm going to trust that you have a purpose in that storm in my life. I need it. Someone else needs it. You're going to use it. We've got to understand that God has that pur has a purpose and a plan. So when you feel like you're sinking, you got to step back and say, hey, God, what are you doing here? If any man lacks wisdom, James says, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. But when you ask, ask with faith. Don't be a double-minded man because they're, un they're unstable in all their ways. Don't be somebody who says, I'm going to ask God about it, I'm going to pray about it, I'm going to talk to you about it, I'm going to give it to you, and then turn around over here and you're all whining about it, confused about it, tore up about it, mad at God about it. Don't be unstable. You can ask him. I don't think you should be questioning his nature. God's good. But I think you can question and ask him about anything that you got going on. But you need to trust him. You need to trust his word. You need to allow his, his principles and his scriptures to be a firm foundation to you. And you've got to understand that your circumstances, uh, that, you're, that you're trusting that they're lining up with his purpose because he's got a big plan out here. And the storm may be for your benefit. It may be for somebody else's benefit. Maybe some for somebody's benefit you have no idea about. And I think about folks who go through things. You know, I think about Priscilla. She spends a lot of time been in the hospital in and out a lot of times. In fact, they, uh, we praise the Lord. They just cut her loose from her physical therapy and stuff. This is what they said. I said, well, we'll probably see her uh, soon. 
Because we normally see her about two or three times a year, and they do. They did. I'm hoping they don't. I'm hoping that, that with her doing what she needs to do at, at home with her medicines and, and, and that type of thing and being the, in, the, in the living environment that she's in now versus what she is, I hope that's a change. I hope that they ain't seen her in two or three months. I hope that they have to decide on their, on their day off or in between lunch to show up there at the house and say, we just want to come see Priscilla because we ain't seen her. But what God has done in those situations, and I can attest to it, that wherever she's been, guess who's been at the, that comes out of her mouth? The testimony of the Lord Jesus. Whether it's her singing those old gospel songs or being able to sit down and play the piano, if they have one where she was at, and they did when she was at Rock Castle, and, uh, you know, to her telling people about her Savior. So you may be going through something. You, you, you may, I, I don't understand. I'm in the storm. I'm going this, I'm going that, I'm dealing with this. You may be going through what you're going through because there is somebody that God is putting in your path that you can share the gospel with them because they need to be saved. You mean that I'm sick so someone else can be saved? I mean somebody else died so you could be saved. I can assure you that God has no problem with allowing us to suffer a little bit to get the gospel to where it needs to go. And so it might be that you're going through what you're going through, that you have an opportunity to be the witness and the testimony and the mouthpiece for your Lord and for your Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen, if you're a saved person, you have inherited already eternal life. To leave this world is being present with Jesus. And so we've got to trust that God has a purpose and a plan, whether it's dealing with sickness, maybe it's something else. But God has a plan. I want you to understand that there's times where we see that God is the one that's directed us right there in the ship that put us on the sea, that put us in the storm. But I want us to also see that in the midst of the storm, Jesus will be there. He didn't just lead him a place he wasn't going to be. Now, I know that he got in the flesh at that point. You know, we understand that Jesus was there in the mountain. They were on the sea. And he says, alone. But it says there at the fourth watch. <laughs> I think he had his eyes on him. He said, how can he see from the mountaintop? God's all seeing God. He's over there communicating with the Father. And he had his eye on them. And upon the fourth watch, it says, of the night, Jesus went unto them walking in the sea. Now look in verse 24. It says, the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. This ain't the first time, neither. They, they, remember there was a time, too, that they were in the boat. Jesus was with them at that point. He was sleeping. Them waves was a rocking. It was like for Jesus, rock a bye, baby. In the tree, he was asleep, sound asleep. The disciples were scared to death. What's he doing over there sleeping? We're going to perish. Somebody wake Jesus up. Well, at this point, he's watching, but it's from a distance. And it's in, the, the ship is, is being tossed to and fro. And so he comes right on time as he always does. Walking. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. <laughs> they were troubled. Now, I want us to understand that Jesus can lead us right to the place where the storm's going to be. I want us to understand that. I also want us to understand that he's watching and he will always be there. He promises not to leave us nor forsake us, and he won't. He promised to be with us to the end of the age, to the end of the world. So wherever we go, as long as we're here, he is present. We have that assurance. Okay? But I want us to understand that as we go through these things in life, that he leads us through, that he's present with us. I want us to understand that his truths have got to give us the assurance. Uh, look what it goes on to say. When the disciples saw him on the water, they were troubled, saying, it is a spirit. They cried out for fear. They had some bad theology for a little while. Worried about a ghost coming after him. Now, was there really spirits? Sure, there's evil spirits. They've experienced Jesus cast out demons of individuals and, and set them free. They understand that. 
And so there's evil spirits out here in the world today. Satan is real. Demons are real. Those things are real. There's no doubt. <clears throat> but folks who think about all this, what they call paranormal activities and so on and so forth, and they say, well, you don't know, Brother Anthony, this thing's moved over here. And this. Satan is a deceiver. And I don't believe that there's no human spirits trapped in between somewhere and out here haunting folks. Demons are real. Satan is real. If you're lost, your soul's going to go to hell and place of torment, and it's not going to be coming out of there until it's brought before the white throne judgment, and then you're going to be cast to the lake of fire. For those that are saved, their soul and spirit's going to go be with Jesus right then, and, it's not, and, then, and then they're going to come back with Jesus at the time of the resurrection and the rapture of the church, and they're going to get a glorified body. There's nothing trapped in between. And so, yes, there's evil spirits out there in the world, but when they see Jesus and they see him out there, they say it's a spirit. They get afraid. I want to know, I want you to understand something. The reason that a lot of times we're sinking in life is because of poor theology. When we have a wrong understanding about things, the wrong things that we believe impact us. That's why it's important for you to be a person who's a student of the book. Study to show yourself approved, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's what we learn and say it every Wednesday with our Awana. That we study the book. As we study the scripture, we understand it's profitable for doctrine. So we have correct teachings. So when you're facing things out there in the world, you're not coming up with some messed up ideas. It's not going to help you and cause you to sink. You got to be grounded, rooted in the word of God. And so as they had this fear, they thought it was a spirit. Um, it says here, but Jesus, but straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter said unto him, Lord, if, it, if, it, if it's you, bid me to come unto thee on the water. And Jesus said, well, come. When Peter was come out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. You know why a person is sinking in life? And not realizing that the Lord's the one that's leading them through the valley, through the sea, through the storm, however you want to state it. They're not realizing that. And so they think they're by themselves when the truth is Jesus is there with them. That's what we see. They got many times got poor theology, got some messed up doctrine. And therefore, they don't have a firm foundation. Which leads them to getting their eyes fixed on their circumstance instead of the Savior that told them to get out of the ship. Get your eyes on everything else, you're going to sink, folks. You have to, you have to have your eyes focused upon the Lord. Peter said, if it's you, then tell me to get out of the ship and let me walk on the water with you. And he said, come. And so Peter did. He got out of the boat. We can't be too critical of the guy. He said he's sinking, but he got out of the boat. Everybody else, like, I'm sitting in here. Let's see if Peter lasts. Huh? If he makes it, maybe we'll get out. But he gets out, he starts walking, but it says as he starts walking on the water, he looks around, he saw the wind. So he took his eyes off. He, he took his eyes off the Lord. It was boisterous. He became afraid. He began to sink. You got to keep your eyes on the Lord. If you're sinking today, it's because your eyes aren't where they need to be. I'm not saying that your circumstance is always going to change. I'm not saying that, oh, if you just look at Jesus, you're never going to have a trouble. You're never going to have a trial. You're never going to have a sickness. You're never going to have a heartache. You're never going to die. No, Stephen died. Hello? He died. He said, that's not hope, brother. Yeah, it is. Jesus stood right there next to the Father, welcoming him to his presence. How could
could a man preach while people are gnashing on him with their teeth, throwing rocks at him? How can you have a peace that you're able to say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do? Because you got your eyes on Jesus and he's standing at the right hand of the Father. And he gives you a peace to pass all understanding that's able to keep your heart and your mind. And when you can't talk, he talks for you. And when you don't know what to do, he's helping you get through it because your eyes are fixed on Jesus. And when you close them on this side of glory, you open them and the presence of God with all of that stuff you've been dealing with is gone and in a place that you never, never can even imagine on what it's going to be like. But that's... That, he, he took his eyes off the Lord. So when you're going through what you're going through, it sets all the more you got to get focused on him. You can't let the wind and the rain and the noise and the thunderings and the lightnings get you off target. You got to stay focused on the Lord. Peter started to sink, and he cried, Lord, save me. <laughs> this is the good news about the sinking part. <laughs> I told you Jesus was there, right? He led you to that place. He was there. When you feel like you're sinking, all you got to do is get right back to him. Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, save me. Help me in this situation. I'm being overwhelmed. You can get overwhelmed, can't you? I told you I was driving down the interstate, not afraid, not afraid. But I'm going to tell you more where, more where of my surroundings. I think not, never, never thought of nothing about driving up and down the interstate and worry about somebody shooting through my window. But where now? Like somebody could be sitting right there. Oh, what about that place over there? You know? Not too long ago, right here in, in Laurel County, you have road rage. Some guy pulls a gun out and shoots somebody else. We live in crazy times. This is Laurel County, Kentucky. This is the Bible Belt. This ain't the city. Folks, we live in difficult times. We live in troublesome times. We live in a fallen, messed up world. Anything can happen. But if you live in light of all what could happen or what has happened, well, you, know, you know what you're going to do? You're going to stay home and then you're going to be afraid of that. Because what if somebody comes to your house? But think about it. Don't think about it. Don't think about it. You'll be overwhelmed. You know what you need to do? Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Things are sinking. We feel like we're sinking in life. What do I do? Understand, Jesus has a plan. He says he works all things out for the good of those who, who love him or call according to his purpose. He has, he's leading us. Trust him. Understand he's with you. Understand that. He led you. He's with you. You got to have, make sure you, make sure you got some, some solid doctrine. That's why you need to be in Sunday school. That's why you need to be in Bible study. That's why you need to be in the sermons. That's why you need to read on your own. You need to know what the book says. So what? Come what may. Come what may. I know who's on the throne. I know what the book says. I know who's working. I know who's a defeated foe. I know I have victory. Like those songs, I'm a winner either way if I go or if I stay. We got to be a people to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. So we're not sinking. And if we are sinking, hey, it's time just to call out on him. Lord Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, help me. Deliver me. I'm overwhelmed. Let him do a work in your life. Miss Stephanie, those are going to help with the invitation. Come. As God spoke to your heart, how will you respond to him today? Will you allow him 
to have his will and his way in your life? Listen, church, it's time for us to, to raise up in the midst of uncertainty because we serve a certain God, right? World shaky, we have a firm foundation. It's time for us to, to realize that, hey, God's, God's made us for a time such as this. So let us let God do his work in our midst. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning. Actually, moving during this invitation. Lord, I pray as you spoke to our hearts that we'd respond to you. May you have your will and your way. If someone lost, may they come. Any other decisions need to be made, things we need to pray about, moves we need to make. May we respond to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.